Hey everyone, hope you're all well. Welcome back to our channel. In today's video, we are going to go over some web development tips um, and specifically tips for a cleaner code and some best practices of web development. We'll explore the principles of cleaner code, what to expect, and some best practices when it comes to uh, writing code, uh, optimizing your images, optimizing with speed, accessibility, and all things web design and development. So if you're ready to master the art of web development best practice and take your websites to the next level, keep watching. So the first best practice tip is planning. So planning your web project thoroughly. Before you even start coding, take some time to define your goals and requirements for the website. This will help you stay on track and avoid making costly mistakes down the road. The next one is using version controls. So version control systems allow you to track changes to your code over time and revert to previous versions if necessary. This is really essential for any web development project, regardless of size and or complex complexity. A really good ver version control system to use is Git and GitHub. So now let's talk about version control. Version control is the practice of tracking and managing changes to files over time. It's really critical for web developers and it allows them to essentially recover from mistakes. Um, so essentially version control will allow them to revert to a previous version of the code that doesn't have the mistake in it. Version control also makes it easy for multiple developers to work on the same project simultaneously without stepping on each other's toes. And version control also provides a complete history of all the changes made over time to a project, which is really helpful for debugging and can under and help understand how the project has evolved. Version control systems typically store a copy of every file on version of a file along with um, information about who made the changes and when, and this can be used to revert to a previous version of the file, compare a different version of the file, and identify who made specific changes. It's essential for any web developer who wants to be able to work efficiently and also collaborate effectively. So that is where Git comes in. Git is a free and open source distribution version control system or VCS and it's used to track changes to files and collaborate with other developers. It's one of the most popular VCS in the world and it's used by millions of developers for a wide variety of projects, including web development, software development and game development. Git works by creating a snapshot of your files every time you make a change. These snapshots are called commits and each commit has a unique identifier called a hash. Git stores the commits in a local repository on your computer and you can also push the commits to a remote repository such as GitHub or GitLab. This allows you to collaborate with other developers and share your code with the world. To use Git, you first need to create a repository for your project, whatever one it is. Um, you can use it. You can use that using the git init command. And once you have created a repository, you can start tracking changes to your file by adding them to the staging area using the git add command. And once you're ready to commit your changes, you can use the git commit command, and this will commit a new commit with your changes and store it in the repository. Git has a number of features um, that make it a really powerful VCS, like branching, merging, and rebasing. Branching basically allows you to create different versions of your code without affecting the main branch. This is useful for developing new features or fixing bugs. Merging allows you to combine two branches into one, and you'll do this if you ever want to integrate changes from a feature branch into the main branch. Rebasing allows you to reorganize your com commit um, without changing their history, and all of that is useful for cleaning up your commit history or making changes to the order of your commits. Git is a really complex, complex tool. Um, it has quite a steep learning curve, but it's really powerful and can be used to manage projects of all sizes. Now, you might have heard of GitHub and it's not to be confused with Git. So Git is a VCS, uh, while GitHub is a web-based uh, cloud-managed um, host, web -based hosting service for Git repositories. In other words, Git is the tool that you would use to track your changes to your code and collaborate with other developers, and GitHub is the place to store your Git repositories and make them accessible to others. You can use Git without GitHub, but it's more convenient to use GitHub to store your Git repositories. This is because GitHub provides a number of features that make it easy to collaborate with other developers like pull requests, issues, and code review. 
to use Git with GitHub, you first need to create a GitHub account, which is free to do. And once you've created an account, you can create a new repository, clone it to your local computer. And once you've cloned the repository, you can start tra tracking changes to your code and pushing your commits to the remote repository on GitHub. And from that point, other developers can then clone the, your own repository and pull your changes. This allows them to see your changes and start working on their own contributions. In web development, Git and GitHub are essential tools for developers. They allow developers to track changes to their code, collaborate with other developers on a project, and deploy their code to production servers. So let's look at the basic workflow for Git. The first thing that you do is clone the repository. So if you're working on a new project, you will need to clone the repository from a remote server like GitHub. And this can be done using the git clone command here. You can also create a new branch after that. So if you're working on a new feature or fixing a bug, you should create a new branch so that you don't affect the main branch. And this can be done using the git branch feature. Next, you want to make changes to your code, whatever changes that is that you need to make. And then you want to stage your changes using the git branch uh, command. And then you want to stage your changes uh, using the git add command. Um, you do this once you're happy with the changes, you need to stage them so that they're ready to be committed. And then you're ready to commit your changes using the git commit command. And then you need to pull the latest changes. So if other developers have made changes to the branch, you need to pull the latest changes before you continue working. This can be done using the git pull command. And lastly, you want to merge your branch onto the main branch. Once you finish working on your feature or your bug fix, you need to merge your branch uh, into the main branch. And this can be done using the git merge command. That's a really basic uh, workflow for Git. There are a number of features and commands that you can use, but this is a good starting point. Um, to set up a Git repository for your web development projects, um, the first thing that you want to make sure that you do is install Git. Um, if you already have Git installed on your computer, if you don't have it installed on your computer, you can go into git.scm.com um, and install it from here. And you want to download the version that you have, um, and then you can create a new repository using the git init command. So now let's look at some basic git um, commands. So one of the first commands that, uh, and the most basic command that you have it, that you'll need to run first is git init, and this will uh, create a new git repository, and it's just simply uh, lowercase git and then init, and that will create a new git repository on your um, file path. If you want to add a file to the staging area, you just want to click, you just want to type in git add, and then the name of the file and the file type. So for example, if you wanted to add a readme file, you can add readme.md. And that'll add a new file labeled this and that file type. To commit the changes in the staging area to the repository, you just want to do git commit uh, m added readme file. If you want to push the commits in your local repository to a remote repository, you just want to do git, git pull uh, origin master. If you ever want to pull changes from a remote repository to your local repository, you want to do... Sorry, this one should be push. And then this one is git pull origin master. To switch to a feature branch, uh, you just want to do git check out feature. To create a new branch called bug fix, you just want to do git branch to create the new branch and then you just want to give it the name, we'll call it bug fix. And then to merge the feature branch onto the master branch, you do git merge master. And lastly, to rebase the feature branch onto the master branch, you just do git rebase master. These are just a few of the many git commands that are available. Um, again, if you want to look at more, you just want to go on to git.scm slash doc. So this is the official documentation for Git and they have everything. They have videos as well and external links. And um, so if you have any questions, there's books and there's reference manuals as well.
that you can use to uh, start working on your Git project. So the next one is image optimization. So images can make up a significant portion of a website's file size. So optimizing them can help improve lo page load times and overall performance. Additionally, op image optimization can also help improve a uh, website, website's SEO ranking. Some optimization's best practices include choosing the right file format, compressing your images, resizing your images, using descriptive file names, and using a CDN to serve your images. Important to follow best practice when getting imagery for your website. One reason is for legal compliance. So using images without the proper permission or license can result in copyright infringement and legal action. By following these rules, you can ensure that you are using images legally and can avoid any legal complication that might, that might occur. High level, uh, relevant quality and accessible images can enhance the user experience on your website. And this can make your website more visually appealing, engaging and informative. This can lead to a higher engagement, longer visit and ultimately better conversion rates. And the consistent use of high quality images that fit with your branding can help establish a strong and recognizable brand identity. This can make your website more memorable and help differentiate your products from competitors. And lastly, as I mentioned before, uh, search engine optimization. So properly optimized images can help improve your website search engine rankings by including the relevant alt text and descriptions. Search engines can better understand the content of the image, leading to better, better visibility in search results. Following best practices when getting images for your website can help you avoid legal complications, enhance the user experience, establish a strong brand, brand identity, and improve your search engine rankings as well. Some things that you want to consider when you are sourcing and adding images to your website. There's several best practices that you need to follow. One thing that you need to follow is that to make sure that you're using high quality images, they should be high resolution and good quality because low quality images can make a website look really unprofessional and unappealing. You want to ensure legal compliance as well, so make sure you have the right to use the image that you're choosing. This means obtaining permission from the owner or using images that are licensed for commercial use. You also want to make sure that your images are optimized for the web to ensure that they load quickly and don't slow down your site. This can be done by compressing the file size and choosing the right file format. You also want to be relevant, so choosing images that are relevant to the content of the website. You want to avoid using generic stock photos too much that don't add any value or relevance to the content and make sure that you consider your branding. So e ensure the images fit with the website's branding and the tone. Use consistent styles and colors to create a cohesive look and feel. Um, and lastly, continuously test and adjust images on the website to ensure they are performing as expected. Use analytics to track engagement and make improvements where necessary. By following best practices, you can ensure that the images on your website are high quality, legal, accessible, relevant, and effective in your engaging your audience. So where to find high quality images that are free to use or at least free to use on the website, um, depending on you know permissions and things like that. One really good image platform uh, website out there is Pexels. So it's a website that provides free stock photos and videos under the Creative Commons Zero, so the CC Zero license. This means that you can use the photos and videos for personal and commercial projects without attribution or any kind of payment. Pexels has a large library of high quality images and videos which are curated by a team of editors to ensure that only the best photos and videos are available on the site. You can search for photos and videos using keywords or browse through popular categories like nature, food and technology. In addition to the free stock photos and videos, Pexels also offer a premium membership that provides access to even more photos and videos as well. They also have additional features like ad free browsing and priority support. One thing that sets Pexel apart from other stock photo websites is their emphasis on diversity and inclusivity. They actively seek out, and f seek out and feature photos and videos that represent people from a wide range of backgrounds and cultures, which makes their library of images more representative and inclusive. It's a great resource for finding high quality stock photos and videos that you can use for a wide range of projects without worrying about licensing fees or attribution requirements as well. So it's also good for small uh, budget businesses or small to medium businesses that don't have a big budget for images, um, but they need you know, high quality images um, for their website. The way Pexels works is that you just uh, go onto the website and you're just using the search bar here um, and you can decide if you want to look for photos or videos and then you just type in what it is that you want to see and what kind of images and you want to be as specific as possible. Um, they have some suggestions as well, but you just type in what you want to, uh, what kind of stock photos that you want and you can see the type of stock photos that uh, come 
that come up as well. If you go into the filters tab, you can decide if you want what kind of orientation that you want, what kind of size that you want, and the main color uh, colorway that you want as well for your photos. Um, so for example, if you want a horizontal photo, you just click on that and decide maybe you want a medium photo. And you can see now the filters are working in the way that we have assigned so we can get the exact kind of photo that we want. To download your image, you want to select the image that you want to download. So like this one for here, for example, and just click on it and you can see the image in full. And what you want to do is go into the free download button. You can either click the free download button and it would, it would download the image in its original format, or you can click on the little drop down and you can decide what size that you want to download the image from, either the original, large, medium, small, and they'll show the dimensions uh, in gray just beside each of the sizes. And then, or you can give a custom size as well. But once you select which size that you want, you just want to click on download selected size and you can say the download uh, pop up at the bottom there as well. Another website that you can use uh, for free stock photos and videos um, is Unsplash. So it works um, pretty much the same as Pexels. So it has a hard li large library of high quality images which are curated by editors as well. Um, difference between uh, Pexels and Unsplash is that their website is kind of uh, categorized a lot easier than Pexels is. So Unsplash does use more use, make more use of the types of categories and it makes it easier to kind of find what you're looking for. But it works the same way. You would just type, click into the search bar here, and just type in what kind of image that you want. And again, you want to be as specific as possible. And then it'll show you a bunch of the images that will kind of fit the description that you give. Um, and then once you have decided on an image, you want to just click into the image itself and decide uh, how what size you want to download it as. You can either do small, medium, large or the original size. Unlike um, Pexels though, um, you can't give your own custom size. So in Pexels, we did see that you can give it own, it, its own custom size. Um, but with the Unsplash, you can just pick from the standard sizing that they give. But then you just click on the size that you want and again, just like on uh, Pexels, it just downloads um, into your download folder and ready for you to use as well. So as mentioned before, one of the best one of the best practices for using images on your site is to use high quality images, but also to make sure that they're actually optimized for web. And this is just to ensure that they load quickly and don't slow down the website. This is done by compressing the file size and choosing the right file format. So for example, JPG and PNG are really good choices for web. Um, when it come, if your choice is between the two, use JPG for photos and PNG for logos. This is because JPG photos are better compressed and it loads faster, whereas PNG will remain, will retain more detail and allows for a transparent background. Um, but it's basically ensuring that you're using the correct type of image on your website in order to, for it to load faster as well. And you also want to make sure that it's compressed so the actual image size isn't too big. The problem with using uh, websites like Pexels and Unsplash is that the size of the photo that you end up downloading is quite big, bigger than what you would need on your website. So once you've downloaded those photos or any photos that you have, you want to make sure that you compress it. And there's several ways that you do that. First up, you can use TinyPNG, which is a free PNG uh, web compression um, tool. It's an online web tool, so you don't need to actually download anything, but it allows you to compress WebP, PNG, and JPEG files. Um, it's really popular. It's used. It's been it's been used um, by lots of people out there, and really easy to use as well. Um, with uh, Tiny PNG, it is free, up to twenty images, um, up to five MB each. So any images that are bigger than that, or if any more Im images, um, you will need to pay for it. But for small kind of projects, um, this is a really good uh, tool to use. What you want to do is click into the drop file here and you just want to uh, drag on the images that you want to uh, upload. And you can see it starts compressing the images and it'll show you um, exactly how much um, data that they saved as well. So this image originally was 253 KB. It is now 130 KB, meaning um, about a four nine percent reduction so you want to make sure that you're using tools like this to ensure that the image is 
as compressed as possible because you don't want a high quality image as well and what's really good about tiny png is that they don't use they don't uh lose a lot of quality as well so you're still getting a good quality image but without the large file size and without slowing down your website as well another way to make sure that your um optimizing your images is to use descriptive file names. So using descriptive file names for your images that include relevant keywords can help your website search engine optimization. And it also helps to resize your image to the appropriate dimensions for your website because large images can slow down your website. So make sure your images are no larger than actually necessary. Another way of optimizing your images is for SEO. So we mentioned before to use descriptive file names, but you also want to include something like alt text and descriptions. So include alt text and descriptions for your images to make them accessible to visually impaired users and improve your website search engine optimization. Last tip that you want to do to make sure that your site, your images are optimized is use lazy loading techniques. So lazy loading techniques to, um, will help improve the loading time of your website. It's a technique where images are only loaded when they are needed rather than all at once when the page loads. By following all these tips, you can optimize your images for your website and improve the loading time and user experience for your visitor. When it comes to adding alt text, you want to add the alt text to the image source tag um, in the HTML code for the web page where the image is located. But a lot of website builders and content management systems like WordPress also have a built-in feature for adding text, alt text to images. And this feature is usually located in the image upload or editing the interface as well. So in terms of imagery on websites, there are lots of websites out there that use that makes good use of imagery on their website. Um, for example, Apple. So Apple is known for its sleek and minimalist design and its website is no exception. The website features really, really high quality images of all their products, um, which are used to kind of showcase their design and their features as well. Um, with their use of imagery, a key aspect of their design strategy, um, as it's known for being clean, minimalist and aesthetic, people use high quality product uh, Apple use high quality product photos to showcase their products and highlight their design features and functionality. In addition to product photography, Apple also uses imagery to create a sense of lifestyle and aspiration. For example, um, if you go onto the Apple Watch page, um, the features of people using the watch, the features of the watch uh, dials and how people are um, interacting with the watches as well. Um, in various settings like running, swimming, meditating, all these images are designed to create a sense of how the product can fit into a user's lifestyle, into their lifestyle and into their daily activities. Their use of imagery also creates a sense of brand identity and consistency. The website features a lot of the consistent color palette and typography, which is used across all of their product pages and marketing materials. This creates a really cohesive and recognizable visual identity for the brand. Overall, Apple's use of imagery is a really key uh, aspect of their des minimalist design, but it highlights the design and function functionality of their products. You also have Airbnb that make good use of their imagery and their design. Their website features really stunning images of properties and destinations around the world. And these images are used to create a sense of traveling, wanderlust and inspire users to kind of book a trip using their platform. Um, it's a key part of their marketing strategy, which is designed to create an emotional connection with their audience and inspire them to travel. The website features stunning images of properties and destinations around the world, which are used to create a sense um, of adventure within people and inspire them to book a trip. One of the key ways that Airbnb uses imagery on the website is to showcase the unique properties that are available for rent. The website features high quality photos of properties, which are often taken by professional photographers to showcase their designs, amenities and their locations. Um, and these images are designed to help users imagine themselves staying in that property and create that sense of anticipation and excitement as well. Airbnb also uses imagery to showcase the local culture and attractions in different destinations. Um, so for example, there's a, quite a few um, images that are designed of like local markets, landmarks and festivals to give users a sense of what it's like to visit a particular destination. These images are designed to kind of create a sense of connection and understanding between travelers and the places that they are visiting. 
Overall, Airbnb's use of imagery is a key aspect of their marketing strategy, which is focused on creating an emotional connection with their audience and inspiring them to travel. The high quality photography and focus on unique properties and local culture help to differentiate the brand from other travel companies and create a memorable and engaging user experience. Nike's website as well features bold and dynamic images of athletes um, and products. The images are used to inspire and motivate users to kind of push their limits and achieve all of their goals as well. And they also have really good uh, big images of their products, uh, which makes it easier for people to envision using them, wearing them and just makes them look really good on the website as well. Um, National Geographic's website is filled with breathtaking images of nature, wildlife and cultures from around the world. These images are used to kind of tell stories and educate users about the world around them. So they make a really good use of all the images um, as well and enc encourages people to kind of stay on the site longer and read a little bit more on their blog and things like that. Next up, you want to look at speed and performance optimization. So users expect websites to load really quickly and perform smoothly. Use caching minification and other techniques to optimize your website's performance. So what is website speed? Website speed is also known as page load time or website performance. It refers to the amount of time it takes for a web page to fully load and become usable for a visitor. It's a critical factor in determining how quickly a website's content, including text, images, videos, and interactive elements, become visible and interactive to users after they click a link or enter a web address in their browser. Website speed is typically measured in seconds or milliseconds and can have a significant impact on user experience, search engine rankings, and overall business success. A fast loading website provides several benefit benefits. Firstly is with user experience. So faster websites can create a smoother and more enjoyable browsing experience. Users are more likely to engage with the content or stay on a site that loads quickly, reducing frustrations and bounce rates. It also has benefits to SEO. So major search engines like Google take website speed into account when determining search rankings. Faster websites are more likely to rank higher in search results, leading to increased organic traffic. Websites that load quickly tend to have a higher conversion rate, meaning more visitors take desired actions like making a purchase, signing up for a newsletter, or filling out a form. And with the rise of mobile browsing, fast loading websites are even more crucial. Mobile users often have slower and less stable connections compared to desktop users, making speed an essential factor for retaining mobile traffic. Quick loading times contribute to a positive perception of a website or brand. Um, conversely, slow loading pages can negatively impact a user's perception of a business, credibility and trust trustworthy witness as well. Fast loading times for websites are more accessible to users with limited internet connectivity as well as those using older devices or browsers. Um, website speed can be affected by various factors, including hosting quality, server response times, page design and complexity, um, image and video sizes as well, um, and the use of CDNs as well. Web developers and site owners often work to optimize website speed by using techniques such as compressing images, reducing unnecessary code, leveraging browser caching, and using effective hosting solutions to ensure a seamless and re responsive user experience. So now let's talk about the different kinds of website speed, including page load time, server speed, and other relevant metrics. So first up, we have page load time. And page load time also refers to the page load speed, or simply load time. This is the total duration it takes for a web page to fully load and become usable in a user's browser. And this includes the time it takes for all the page's resources, like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, and videos, to be fetched and rendered. A faster page load time results in a more satisfying user experience, lower brightness rates, and better conversion rates. And then we have server response time, and this is often called time to first byte, or TTFB, and it measures the time it takes for a web server to respond to a user's request once they've clicked on a link or entered a URL. It includes the time required for the server to process the request and retrieve the necessary data from databases or other sources and send back the initial response. A lower server response time indicates a more efficient server and contribute to a faster page loading time. So render time is the period between when a web browser receives all necessary 
uh, resources from the server and when it completes rendering the entire page, making it visible and interactive for the user. It encompasses tasks like parsing HTML, applying CSS styles, executing JavaScript and rendering images. Optimizing render time is essential for ensuring a smoother user experience. Next up, we have First Contentful Paint, or FCP. FCP measures the time it takes for the first visual element to appear on the screen as the page loads. This could be the background text, uh, image, or um, other audio files. FCP provides insight into how quickly users perceive that a page is loading, contributing to their initial impression of speed. Next up, we have Time to Interactive, or TTI. TTI measures the time it takes for a page to become fully interactive, allowing users to engage with elements like buttons, forms, and links. TTI is really crucial because users expect uh, to be able to interact with the page as soon as it's visually loaded. Next up, we have connection metrics, and these include metrics related to the process of establishing a connection to the server, like DNS resolution time, so this is the time taken to translate a domain name into an IP address. Then you have TCP handshake time, so the time taken to establish a connection, and SSL handshake, so the time taken to establish a secure connection if that's applicable. And lastly, we have content delivery metrics. For websites using content delivery networks, or CDNs, metrics relate to CDN performance, like edge server's response time and cache hit rate. Um, and all of these are really important. CDNs help distribute content across multiple servers to reduce latency and improve load times. A really popular CDN to use is Cloudflare. Cloudflare is very widely used and um, it can significantly improve page loading times and enhance website performance. It offers a range of features designed to optimize content delivery, mitigate security threats, and improve the overall user experience. Um, the way Cloudflare works is that it has essential kind of global network. So Cloudflare operates a vast network of data centers loca located across the world. So when you use Cloudflare, your website's content is cached and distributed across these data centers. And this means that when a user visits your website, they are served content from the nearest data center, reducing the physical distance and latency between the user and the server. And by distributing cl content closer to users, Cloudflare reduces that time it takes for data to travel between the user's device and the server, thus resulting in faster loading times and more responsive website um, as well. Other than that, Cloudflare also provides a lot of security and DDoS protection. So Cloudflare's WAF, the Web Application Firewall, has pr helps protect your website from various online threats, including malicious bots and hacking attempts. And a secure website tends to perform better since it's not dealing with security-related disruptions. Um, in essence, Cloudflare acts as an intermediary between your website and users, optimizing the way content is delivered, improving loading times, and enhancing security. It's really um, important to note that while Cloudflare can provide significant import improvements in your performance. The extent of improvement can vary based on factors like your website's existing architecture, content, and ge geographical audi um, audience distribution. So it's not just the only thing they need to think about, but it's definitely a factor that can help. So now let's talk about website speed and user experience. So the relationship between website speed and UX and bounce rates is a really critical aspect of web design and optimization. When users first land on a web page, their first impression is heavily influenced by how quickly the page loads, and a fast page loading time creates a positive initial experience, while a slow loading page can lead to frustration and user in, uh, impatience. Users are more likely to engage with a site that, use, that loads quickly, and they can start consuming content, interacting with elements, and achieving their goals um, without any kind of delay. Slow loading times may cause users to lose interest and abandon the site altogether. Mobile users as well, who are often on the go, rely on cellular networks, and they have even less patience for slow loading pages. Optimizing for mobile is crucial nowadays to cater to, for the growing segment of users. Um, it's now one of the main ways that people come onto a site. Um, they tend to use mobile more than desktop. So making sure that your website page and all the pages are optimized for mobile um, is really crucial. So with bounce rates, um, and website speed. Bounce rate is essentially the percentage of visitors who navigate away from the website after only viewing one page. A high bounce rate is often indi um, indicative of visitors leaving the site without actually engaging further. 
Um, slow loading pages can significantly contribute to high bounce rates. Um, if users aren't met with a delay in accessing content, they might become frustrated and leave the site before exploring what it actually offers. Users have short attention spans and they expect websites to provide immediate value. So slow loading pages can test their patience and lead to them seeking alternatives. Bounce rates have a direct impact on conversion rates. If users are leaving the site without taking any actions like making a purchase or signing up, the website's overall conversion performance is affected. To mitigate the negative effects of slow loading times on bounce rates and UX, it's essential to prioritize website opt optimization. And again, this includes optimizing images, minifying code, uh, leveraging browser caching, reducing server response times, and considering the, the use of CDNs. Regularly monitoring and testing your website performance is key to ensuring a positive user experience and lower bounce rates. So now let's talk about how website speed affects SEO. Website speed has a significant impact on your search engine optimization. Search engines like Google consider website speed as a ranking factor because they want to deliver the best possible user experience. So here's how website speed affects SEO. Google has off officially confirmed that website speed is a ranking factor in its algorithm. Websites that load faster are more likely to rank higher in search engines, result, um, and Google aims to provide users with fast and relevant search results, so it rewards websites that offer better loading times. Search engines prioritize websites that provide a positive user experience. Slow loading websites frustrate users and discourage them from staying on the site or returning in the future. As a result, search engines want to promote websites that load quickly to ensure users have a smooth experience. Slow loading page pages tend to have a higher bounce rate, which refers to users leaving a website after a short while. Um, and high bounce rates can signal to search engines that the content on the page might not be relevant or the user experience is, for, is poor. Conversely, fast loading pages leads to a longer dwell time, so the time users spend on a page, um, indicating higher engagement and satisfaction. Search engines also allow a crawl budget to each website, which determines how often search bots crawl and index a site's page. A slow loading website may consume more of its crawl budget on loading pages, leaving fewer resources for crawling and indexing the most important content. And with mobile devices becoming the primary way users access the internet, Google has shifted to mobile first indexing. This means that Google primarily uses the mobile version of the content for indexing and ranking. Mobile friendliness, which includes fast loading times on mobile devices, is crucial for SEO. Core Web Vitals are a set of user experience metrics that considers Google's that Google considers essential for determining page experience, and these metrics include largest content full paint, so LCP, first input delay, FID, and cumulative layout shift, CLS, um, which measures loading performance as and it's particularly important for website speed and SEO. To improve website speed for better SEO. Steps that you can consider are optimizing images, so essentially compressing images to reduce file sizes without sacrificing quality, removing unnecessary code, leveraging browser caching, um, and optimize server response time. So ensure that your hosting provider can respond quickly to user requests as well. By prioritizing website speed, you're not only improving user experience, but also boosting your website's chance of ranking higher in search engines, um, driving more traffic to your website. So let's talk a bit more on how to improve your website speed. And this involves com a combination of optimizing various aspects of your website, including code, images, server configurations, and a lot more. The first thing that you want to do is conduct a speed test. And we'll talk a little bit later on how to do that. But you want to use online tools like Google PageSpeed Insights, GGT Metrics, to analyze your website's current performance. These tools provide insights into what elements of your website are slowing it down. Images are often a significant contributing factor to slow loading times. Compress and resize images before you upload them to your site, and considering using modern image formats like WebP, which offers better compression without actually compromising the quality. Removing unnecessary white space comments and code from your CSS, um, JavaScript, and HTML files. Um, this seems small, but it does reduce the file size and makes them load a lot better. 
Configure your server to set expiration dates for the static resources, and this allows browsers to cache these resources so returning visitors don't need to re-download them. CDNs distribute your website's content across multiple servers worldwide, and when a user requests a page, the server closest to them delivers the content, reducing latency and load times. You want to enable gzip compression on your server. This compresses your website files before sending them to the user's browser, reducing data transfer times. Ensure your web hosting server is responsive, so if you experience the slower uh, server response times, consider upgrading your hosting plan or switching to a more reliable hosting provider. For more information about what of some good um, hosting providers that are out there, we do have quite a few videos comparing different hosting providers, especially for uh, e-commerce websites, so make sure you give that a go. Each redirect that you have adds additional time to the page load process, minimizing the use of redirects or ensuring that they are necessary for the user experience or SEO purposes. And if you're using a content management system like WordPress, consider using caching plugins. These plugins generate static versions of your pages to reduce uh, server load times and improve load times as well. And most importantly, continually uh, monitor your website speed using various tools and conduct regular performance tests. So it's not enough just to do it once and make improvements. Um, you want to have a set schedule to conduct a speed test and see if there's any new issues that come up, especially if you are if your website has lots of content on it that's constantly being uploaded and being worked on. You want to make sure that you do a speed test um, every so often to highlight new issues and fix them as soon as possible. Each website is unique, so the specific optimizations required can vary. It's recommended to make these changes one at a time, test the impact after each change, and keep track of your website's performance to ensure you're headed in the right direction. So speaking of conducting speed tests, there are lots of tools and applications out there to help you test it. Two of the most important ones that we're going to talk about today is GT Metrics and Google Page Speeds. So GT Metrics is a really popular web performance testing tool and it provides detailed insights into your website's loading speed and performance. It offers a really comprehensive analysis of various aspects that impact your website speed and user experience. It combines Google's page speeds and Yahoo's YSLOW, both of which are performance anal anal analysis algorithms to provide a holistic view of your website speed and performance. Some key features of Google Page Speed or GT Metrics is that it provides a page score out of 100 that evaluates your website's performance based on Google's recommendations, and this score reflects uh, how well your website uh, follows best practices. So, to get started on how to use GT Metrics, you want to go onto gtmetrics.com. And all you need to do is enter the URL that you want to test and you just want to click on test your site. What's really cool about GT Metrics is that you can really configure the testing environment. So for example, um, the default environment is that it'll test in Canada using Chrome desktop with an unthrottled connection. If you click into the change options button, now you do need to set up an account for this, but it's free, but then click into analysis options. And then what you want to do is test uh, change the test format so you can change the location so right now it's Canada but you can change it to uh, North American location Middle East Asia Pacific um, or even the UK and then you can test uh, what device so is it Chrome um, is it um, mobile is it uh, Google Nexus things like that so you can really test the device and the browser that it's using and uh, with what kind of connection, so 4G slow, 4G, 3G, unthrottled, things like that. Um, and then once you're done, you just want to click on analyze to actually test your site and then just wait for the analysis to complete and review the results using the page speed score, Y slow, loading time, waterfall chart and all the recommendations. So as mentioned, one of the key features is the page score. Um, you get a score out of 100 and it's graded. 
um, and it evaluates your website's performance based on Google's recommendation. And this score reflects how well your site follows best practices. Um, the score is both the grade and the performance, and it evaluates your website's performance based on Yahoo's recommendations as well. It, aspect, it assesses, assesses various aspects of your site, including cache settings, JavaScript, and CSS optimization, and a lot more. Um, it also has the loading time and page sizes as well. So GT Metrics displays the actual loading time of a web page and its total size in kilobytes. Um, these metrics give you a clear idea of how fast your page loads and how much data it consumes. Then it has something called the waterfall chart and the waterfall chart provides a visual representation of how each element on your web page loads and it shows the sequence and timings of requests made to fetch re resources like images, scripts and style sheets. It also has performance scores by category. Um, so tools, it breaks down your performance in two categories like um, browser timings, connection duration, backend duration, total blocking time, things like that. And it highlights areas where your site is performing well and highlights areas where it could be uh, improved. The tool also offers specific recommendations and suggestions for optimizing website performance. If you go into the summary tab and what it does, it gives you issues that are currently on your website and it also marks a priority on them if it's high priority, low priority or medium. Uh, GT Metrics also allows you to compare the performance of multiple pages or website side by foot side in the compare a section here. You can compare it with another URL and it also offers monitoring features to regularly track your website performance over time. And as mentioned before, you can choose to test your website performance on both mobile and desktop devices. And this is really crucial considering Google's emphasis on mobile first indexing um, and user experience as well. So when it comes to using GT Metrics Insights, focus on improving the page speed and why slow scores by addressing the recommendations provided. You wanna pay attention to the waterfall chart in this tab here um, to clearly identify elements causing delays in loading. Um, you want to implement the suggestions for optimizing images, scripts, and style sheets, and you want to use browser caching and leverage a CDN if you don't already to improve load times. And always, always regularly test your website performance and monitor improvements over time. GT Metrics is a really valuable tool for website owners, developers, and anyone interested in enhancing the website's performance and user experience. It's also free, so it makes it even more valuable. Um, and by analyzing the insights provided by GT Metrics, you can make uh, informed decisions to optimize your website for faster loading times and better overall experience. So next up we have Google PageSpeed Insights and this is a web for performance an analysis tool provided by Google themselves and they evaluate the speed and performance of web pages. It offers viable insights and recommendations to help improve website owners and developers' websites and help them optimize their sites for faster loading times and improved user experience. So it works very similar to Google Page uh, GT Metrics. So you want to go onto the website and then just enter the URL that you want to um, test and you just want to click on analyze, wait for the analysis to run and then it will then provide you with a score um, for both desktop and mobile. So some key features of uh, PageSpeed Insights is the performance scoring. So PageSpeed Insights assigns a score to your web page um, based on its performance and the scoring is given on a scale um, on 0 to 100 and you see what the performance scale as well. Um, and then it also has scoring for best practices, how you're following SEO and accessibility. And it's divided into two categories, one for mobile devices and one for desktop devices as well. PageSpeed Insights provides both field data and lab data. So field data is based on real world user experience collected from the Chrome user Ex experience report, while lab data is generated in a controlled environment. And this combination gives you in insights into high real user experiences on your website. Um, PageSpeed Insights will then identify specific opportunities um, listed here to improve your page performance. And these opportunities are categorized again and include suggestions like optimizing images, eliminating render blocking resources, leveraging browser caching, and things like that.
The tool also provides web co core web vitals metrics like LCP, uh, FID, and CLS, and these metrics help you understand how users experience at your page loading times as well. So when it comes to um, using the page insights, insights results, um, you want to pay attention to both the mobile and the desktop results as well, and just make sure that you remember that they are two separate things. Um, a higher score indicates a better performance, and you have the performance um, score here. Review the opportunity section to identify specific areas for improvement, and follow the suggestions to optimize images, reduce render blocking resources, and improve uh, response time. You want to address any diagnostic issues highlighted by PageSpeed Insights, and these issues can have a significant impact on your loading speed and user experience. And take note of the Core Web Vitals metrics. You want to aim to improve LCP, FID, and CLS values as they directly contribute to a better user experience. As mentioned before, just like GT metrics, with PageSpeed Insights, you want to regularly test and monitor the performance of your pages to continuously make improvements to ensure a consistent and optimized web experience. And again, the really good thing about PageSpeed Insight is that no, not only do you get a score for performance, but you also get a score for best web practices, accessibility, and SEO. And all of each of these categories, they'll also give you opportunities um, for um, improvement as well. So definitely a good thing to check out um, while you are testing the performance as well. Google PageSpeed Insight is a valuable tool for optimizing your website's performance according to Google's best practices, and it's also free. So by addressing the recommendations and insights provided by PageSpeed Insights, you can create faster loading pages that deliver an enhanced user experience and contribute to better search engine rankings. Responsive design is the next best practice that you want to focus on, and it just ensures that your website looks good on all function on looks good on all devices and functions well on all devices, from desktop computers to smartphones and tablets. And lastly, accessibility standards. So accessibility basically just means that everyone should be able to use your website regardless of their abilities. Make sure your website follows accessibility standards, um, such as using alt text for images and providing transcripts for videos. Let's talk a little bit more about how accessibility standards affects web development best practice. So what is website accessibility? Website accessibility refers to the practice of designing and developing websites that can be used by everyone, including people with disabilities. It means creating websites that are designed with accessibility in mind so that people with disabilities can access and use the content and functionality of the website. This includes people with visual, aud auditory, physical, and cognitive disabilities as well. It's important for users because it ensures that all individuals, regardless of abilities or disabilities, they can access your website and use it effectively. Here are some, wa here are some ways in which website ac accessibility can affect users. Um, website accessibility ensures that people with disabilities are not excluded from the information, products, and services provided by websites. It includes people with visual, auditory, motor, and cognitive impairments. Accessible websites are easier to use for everyone, not just people with disabilities. For example, having clear and concise headings, labels, and instructions can help all users navigate a website more easily. When websites are accessible, people with disabilities can engage more fully with the content, products, and services provided. This can lead to an increased satisfaction and loyalty amongst these users as well. In a lot of countries, including the United States, websites must comply with accessibility laws and failure to do so can result in legal action as well. So here are some website accessibility best practices. The first one is uh, providing text alternatives. So providing text alternatives is really important um, as it ensures that people who are unable to see images or videos or other non-text content on a website can still access the information provided. Um, and this can include things like alt text, so alternative text, and that's just a brief description of an image that is read by screen readers or other assistive technologies. Um, caption and transcripts, so video and audio context content should be accompanied by captions and transcripts, respectively. Captions provide a text version of the spoken content, content while tra transcripts provide a written version of the entire audio or video. And links as well should be descriptive and clearly indicate the content of the web page that they're leading to. For example, instead of using words like click here, a link should say something like download our brochure so that once they click on it, it'll actually download the brochure. By providing text alternatives, website owners can ensure that all users can access the information provided on the website regardless. Semantic, semantic 
markup is a way of writing HTML that provides meaning and context to the contact content on a web page. It involves using HTML elements that accurately describe the purpose and structure of the content rather than just formatting the content for display purposes. Some benefits of using cementing markup include uh, making websites more accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, search engines use semantic markup to understand the content of a web page and rank it in search engines. By using semantic markup, website owners can improve their website's SEO and increase their visibility in search engines. And semantic markup provides a consistent structure to the content on a web page, which can make it easier to maintain and update over time. It also helps ensure that the content displayed cor is displayed correctly on different browsers and examples and devices. Some examples of semantic markup include uh, heading elements, h1, h2, h3, uh, list elements like UL and OL. Keyboard navigation is a method of navigating a website using only the keyboard without the need of a mouse or other pointing device. Keyboard navigation is an important aspect of website accessibility because it ensures that people with disabilities that affect their ability to use a mouse or other pointing devices can still navigate the website effectively. Some best practices for keyboard navigation include using making sure that the logical tab order when a user presses the tab key to move between different elements on the web page, it should focus moving in a logical way that follows the visual layout of the page. And this ensures that users can navigate the website efficiently and predictably as well. Keyboard shortcuts can help users quickly access frequently used features or functions on a website. However, it's really important to ensure that the shortcuts are easy to remember and don't conflict with other keyboard shortcuts on the user's computer. When an element has focus, it should be visually indicated on the web page so that users can see where where they are in the navigation process and this can be done through CSS styling like such as uh, border or outline uh, around the focus element and it's important to test keyboard navigation on a website to ensure that it's easy to use and works correctly um, and this can be done by using keyboard only navigation testing tools or by conducting user testing with people who use assistive technologies. Color contrast is an important aspect of website accessibility and it affects how, user, how easily users can read text and distinguish different elements on a web page. It's important to ensure that there is enough contrast between the text and the background color so that it's easy to read, especially for users with uh, visual impairments. And lastly, using clear and simple language is also a really important aspect of website accessibility. This can help ensure that users, all users can understand the content on a web page, and especially important for users with cognitive or learning disabilities, as well as users who are not fluent in the language used on the website. Plain language uh, involves using simple words and sentences structures to convey information, and it's important to avoid jargon, technical terms, or complex sentence structure that can be difficult for some users to understand. Um, by using clear and simple language, websites can website owners can ensure that all users can understand the content on the website and access the information that they need. So once you have some basic uh, understanding of what best practices are for your website uh, accessibility, there are some tools out there that can help you um, analyze your website and make sure that it is actually accessible for users to use. First up, you have the uh, WAVE Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. Um, and the WAVE Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool is a free online tool provided by WebAIM um, and allows you to enter the URL of your website and generates a detailed accessibility report. The WAVE tool highlights potential accessibility issues on your website, like missing alternative text for images, colored contrast problems, improper heading structure, and lots more. It provides visual indicators and explanations to help you understand and address the accessibility concern. So the way it works is you just navigate to the website and you just want to type in the website uh, URL. And then you just want to click on the arrow to continue analyzing. And it'll essentially load your website and give you a list of errors, if there are any, um, and some improvements as well that you can make as well. If you click on the view t t details, you can see um, everything that you're doing correct, everything that you're uh, not doing correct and just from there you want to improve um, on anything that they're marking as an error um, and as an error and an alert as well. By using the WAVE tool you can identify areas of improvement and take steps to make your website more accessible to a wider range of users. It's a viable resource for both developers and website owners who are looking to enhance the accessibility of their web content. 
Next up, you have uh, the A Checker accessibility tool. So, A Checker is a web accessibility evaluation tool that allows you to ass assess the accessibility of your web pages. Similar to the Wave tool, you can either you can either enter the URL of your website or upload uh, HTML files for evaluation. The tool checks your website content against various accessibility standards, like the uh, laid out in the WCAG, so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, and then it also provides a detailed report highlighting accessibility issues like missing alternative text, improper heading structure, color contrast problems, um, and lots more. It also provides suggestions and guidelines on how to address the identified issues as well. So similar to how Wave Tool works, you just want to type in the name of the URL that you want to scan, or you can upload the HTML files as well, and then you just want to click on Check It. And the A checker tool will then uh, run a report where you can see any kind of errors that may come up. So you can see down here there is a uh, accessibility errors uh, listed below, um, and you can just essentially go through this review, and it'll show you uh, exactly line by line exactly where the missing text or where the errors are. And it'll show you what the actual reason is as well. So for example, create content that can be presented in a different way, um, make it easier for users to see, see and hear content, including separating foreground from the background, essentially, and things like that. And it gives you suggestions as well. So it's a little bit more um, um, practical than the Wave tool because it gives you actual practical solutions, but both tools are really uh, handy to use as well to check your site for accessibility issues. So now let's go over some websites that have incorporate good accessibility values on their website. Uh, one example of a website with good accessibility is the BBC website. The BBC has made significant efforts to make their website accessible to all users, including those with a disability. Some of the features that they have are uh, the clear and simple language. Um, so like clear and simple sentence structure to make the content easy to understand for all users. They have good color contrast. Um, so most of the text is in black when the white background as well, making it really easy to read. Um, there is also keyboard navigation being used uh, using the tab. So that's really important for users to have difficulty using a mouse. There are also text alternatives as well to images um, for those using screen readers or other assistive technologies. Images as well are captioned appropriately. Videos are also captioned appropriately as well. Um, making it really easy for those who are deaf or hard of hearing. Overall, BBC website serves as an excellent example of how website accessibility can be achieved through a variety of features and best practices. Another example of a website with good accessibility is the gov.uk website. So the UK government website has made a really strong commitment to ensuring that their website is accessible to all users, including those with disabilities. Some of the accessibility features include clear and simple language, um, good color contrast as well, so similar to the BBC website. Um, they also incorporate the tab uh, keyboard navigation as well, making it really easy to explore the website for people who maybe have difficulties using a pointing device. Um, the website does have text alternatives for any images used, um, and they also have a focus on accessibility testing as well. So the UK, UK government has a de dedicated team of accessibility experts who test the website for accessibility issues and work to resolve them as well. So overall, the, the gov.uk website is an excellent example of how website accessibilities can be achieved through a, combine, through a combination of accessibility features as well. So here are some additional tips for web development best practices. The first one is to use a CMS. A CMS can help you manage your website's content more easily without having to write any code. You can also use a framework, and frameworks essentially will provide you with a set of pre-written code and tools which can save you time and effort. You want to use a CDN um, to help improve the performance of your website because it will help deliver static content from servers that are closer to your users. And test your website thoroughly. Before you even launch your website, make sure to test it thoroughly on different devices and browsers. This will help catch any bugs or compatibility issues. And lastly, keep monitoring your website. After your website is launched, continue to monitor its performance, security, speed, and SEO. This will help you identify and fix any problems quite early on. By following these web development practices, you can create high quality, user-friendly, and secure websites and web applications that will meet the needs of your users and help you to achieve your business goals.
And that's a wrap for today's video on web development best practices. I hope you find this exploration informative and inspiring. Feel free to leave your comments and questions on any topics you'd like us to cover in the comments below. And I'll see you in the next one.